good evening everybody and i am very thankful to indian orthopedic association for giving me the opportunity to uh, explain about the close wedge high tibial osteotomy uh, infratuberosity but it's not exactly infratuberosity but it is at the level of tibial tuberosity uh, as uh, we know uh, proper planning prevents poor performance if we fail to plan we plan to fail. So proper planning is extremely important in particularly high tibial osteotomy. Either it may be the open wedge or it can be a closed wedge. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Rastogi has already mentioned about the preoperative planning, but still I will explain very sh in a uh, few slides only. Uh, commonly following, we are following the method Piniaki, which is the most perfect method in which First, we draw a mechanical line that is centered from femoral head to the center of the ankle joint. And then we draw a second line that, uh, or line one, what we call it, is represents the planned weight bearing line uh, for the post operative correction and extending from the center of the hip through a coordinate of 60 to 72 percent of tibial plate to width. Either we can say it as a Fujisawa point also. And uh, line two, which we draw from osteotomy hinge point that is on the medial side of the proximal tibia in case of close wedge high tibial osteotomy to the center of the ankle joint and another line three that connects the osteotomy hinge point with the arc of intersection of line one and the angle formed between these two lines is our correction angle that is what we call it as alpha angle and then after uh, measuring this alpha angle we remove the wedge uh, we put a first cut at the level of tibial tubercle just below the attachment of patellar tendon like this and then another cut what we put uh, at the uh, at alpha angle and then we remove the wedge uh, like this and then we close the high uh, osteotomy site like this after fibular osteotomy and we can here see that uh, the weight bearing axis has been now passing through the desired level, that is what we call it as a Fujisawa point. Now, uh, uh, as I already told you, the site of osteotomy is not exactly the infratuberosity, but it is at the level of tibial tuberosity, just below the attachment of patellar tendon, and it is an oblique osteotomy with a base in the diaphysis of the lateral cortex. Here we can see base is in the diaphysis here and apex is in the metaphysis. So uh, we try to bring the apex as high as possible. So we uh, we have a broad surface area in contact after high tibial osteotomy. So I would say it is a diaphysial metaphysial osteotomy. It's not a diaphysial osteotomy. So this is how what we can see here at the level of tibial tuberosity for apex in the metaphysis. This is how it is. it has been removed and closed like this. And here we should take care that the apex should be exactly at the medial border, medial border of the tibia. So it should not be away from the medial border or it should not be lateral to the medial border. So this is very important for uh, desired correction after high tibial osteotomy. So certain equipments is required. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, we are fixing always, we are not giving plasters. So first of all, this is the uh, wages prepared of every degree. I have a wages starting from six degree to 30 degree. So whatever the correction, what we want to achieve, we have we should have a wage like this. And uh, another thing, this plate, Tomofix, what we call, and now it is available in India, uh, Indian by Indian company also. And we, we will require this patella holding clamp to hold the osteotomy properly. Uh, so the method in which we don't remove the whole posterior cortex, here we can see that this savage has been removed, but we keep the posterior cortex intact. We cut the posterior cortex only at the distal osteotomy, distal cut of the osteotomy. So we can slide the distal fragment or the proximal fragment, and this spike will support the uh, will stabilize will give more stability to the osteotomy site not only that we also preserve the lateral cortex with his uh, vascular attachment this lateral cortex we preserve with their soft tissue attachment 
and then we remove only this part of the osteotomy and this will be remain vascular this will work as a vascular bone graft and uh, then after that we will close it and then fix it with the plate and screws now uh, this uh, 47 year old lady uh, has a medial compartment osteoarthritis knee and uh, there was no fixed flexion deformity there was no ligament laxity so uh, so in this particular case uh, there is a difference in uh, if we are planning at least i am planning uh, on a non weight bearing full length x ray i don't plan on the weight bearing full length x ray because there is always some difference uh, in angle in a, a weight bearing full length x ray non weight bearing full length x ray if we see here here if we plan uh, this is the weight bearing sorry this has been written wrongly this is uh, weight bearing x ray and this is non weight bearing x ray there is a difference this is a mistake here it's a non-weight bearing which shows varus of 7 degree and uh, this is the weight bearing x-ray and that shows uh, varus of 10 degree. This x-ray is of same patient, weight bearing and non-weight bearing. So, there is a difference of 3 degree in a weight bearing and non-weight bearing full length x-ray. So, if we are planning a close wedge, particularly uh, at the level of tubal tubercle, we are doing all planning in the non-weight bearing full length x-ray. Why? Because if I do planning, in the weight bearing x-ray, uh, I will get over correction of 3 degree and uh, it's a game of only few degrees. So, if we do always in the weight bearing x-ray, then it may end up with the over correction. So, this is how we are doing planning uh, in the non-weight bearing full length x-ray and according to Miniaki method, in particularly in this uh, method, uh, uh, in this particular patient, we have to remove the wedge of 12 degree. This will be the apex and uh, hinge of the osteotomy site and we have to remove 12 degree of uh, wage from particularly for this patient. And uh, another thing what I am doing, I am planning uh, uh, to measure intraoperatively. So my uh, aim is to bring the weight bearing axis from this point. So, uh, long axis of TB after surgery of high tibial osteotomy, it should uh, come in this direction. This should be the long axis of tibia. So, I usually uh, take intraoperative x ray and then I measure the intraoperative angle, not um, MPTA, not medial proximal tibial angle, but I uh, measure the angle between distal femoral line. This is the distal femoral line. This is the distal femoral line. And this is the long axis of tibia. So, particularly in this patient, uh, uh, this is uh, our target is to achieve this angle 94 degree. So, uh, exit to achieve exit 94 degree is very difficult. So, we keep some range. It's a game of only few degrees. So, our aim is to achieve uh, the angle between 92 to 95, right? So, we have a target at 94 degree, but we can accept up to 92 to 95. And so this is our plan post-operative long, long axis of tibia. This is the plan post-operative long axis of tibia after surgery. So now how we can measure, how we can check during surgery, because I don't rely on quadricord test, because quadricord test is not a reliable method, because it may have, it may mislead many times. So uh, we made a template like this. This is, uh, this represents the long axis of femur, and this uh, represents uh, eight, that 80 MPH, 87 degree, this long axis uh, of tibia, this is normal. And then we have drawn one another line, which is green line, what we hear, we can see is, and this is 92 degree. So our tibia should be minimum uh, during surgery in a post per operative x-ray, long axis of tibia should be at least uh, on this line. So this is our plan. Sorry, my internet connection probably may not be uh, perfect. And one another line that is uh, 97 degree. So we have targeted our long axis of tibia on 92 degree. Sorry. Uh, uh, now uh, I will show the operative method, how we do the surgery.
can you leave can you uh, can everybody hear me yes okay this is the uh, incision midline incision is being put proximal tibia is being exposed and then periosteum is elevated from the area where uh, the wedge is to be removed so this is the periosteum i am erasing from the proximal tibia from which from where we have to remove the wedge and then i fix this is this must be 12 degree or whatever the required wedge is to be removed uh, here we can see that apex is exactly on the medial border of the tibia and then i fix it with uh, two k wires on the proximal tibia this is the proximal cut of the osteotomy and this is the distal cut of the osteotomy this is and here in sage we can see that this is how the wedge is to be removed this is uh, after that i uh, separate the lateral cortex still i have not uh, detached the soft tissue attachment of the lateral cortex after doing multiple hole in the lateral cortex by k wire i separate it out with uh, its vascular attachment like this here we can see this piece has been separated and then wedge is to be removed like this and then one screw is passed in the proximal uh, fragment uh, with SS wire and uh, another is in the distal fragment. Previously, I was uh, uh, doing it is, uh, it is at the parallel of the osteotomy, but now I am uh, passing this uh, screw juxta articular. This is the distal screw is being passed. And then after doing this, Still, I have not cut the posterior cortex. Posterior cortex is still in cat. And then I osteotoma is the segment of the fibula. Like this. And then I cut the only distal cortex of the osteotomy. I keep the post proximal co posterior cortex intact. And then I slide the distal tibia over the proximal posterior cortex. And then after closing the osteotomy, I hold this. Uh, with this clamp, pointed clamp, I hold osteotomies like this, and then I tighten the uh, stainless steel wire between one proximal and one distal screw on the lateral cortex. This is how the SS wire is being tightened. Now it will become a very stable osteotomy after tightening this uh, stainless steel wire. And then I fix on the medial side with the medial locking plate. Any plate we can use, but usually I am using Tomofix because it is an angle stable implant and very uh, strong implant. And then first I pass the cortical screw in the distal fragment. Uh, and after that, uh, one cortical screw with the proximal fragment, if I get a space, otherwise sometimes I cannot get the space on the proximal fragment. Uh, fragment to pass a cortical screw. So I have to pass only three uh, lock, locking screw in the proximal fragment. This is how we fix it. Uh, proximal and then the distal screw is also being fixed. Remaining SS wire is also being cut and this is after closure of the osteotomy. This is how we are doing close wedge high tibial osteotomy. Now, during surgery, uh, we take per operative x-ray like this after tension band wiring and uh, this clamp is being pulled and this per operative x-ray, I put it on this template like this and then I measure and I uh, whether I have uh, achieved the desired correction or not. Here we can see that the long axis of TBI is exactly here in the green line. That is 92 degree what we have calculated pre of before surgery. And uh, this is how if we are satisfied that we have achieved the adequate correction, then and then we do remaining fixation. Right. So this is the uh, method to avoid the under correction. So and, uh, if we so see on a model, then we can see here that uh, uh, the wage is removed like this. This cortex is kept intact with this soft tissue attachment and only this proximal posterior cortex is not cut only distal posterior cortex is being cut and this is how it has been closed 
and here during surgery we hold like this one point keep we keep here and second point of the uh, patella holding force up we keep like this and plate uh, after that we put a plate and fix it with the screw and this is the final picture of the fixation here we can see this blue uh, dynaplast represents as a soft tissue attachment of this fragment and this is the uh, uh, screw and this is the tension band wire on this side and this is the strong plate on the medial side so it becomes stable from everywhere on lateral cortex, it is a vascularized bone graft with this tension band wiring. On medial side, it is a uh, strong topofix with uh, their locking screws. And in posterior aspect, we can see here the strong posterior cortex is supporting the osteotomy like this here. And so it becomes stable from all the three surfaces. So it becomes very stable. So we can allow them to uh, pass, do a partial weight bearing from the next day. Here, if we see the post-operative angle of this, this by all method, we can see this is full length on full length X-ray weight bearing line is passing from the Fujisawa point. And if we measure mechanical, there is a varus valgus of four degree. That is what our desire, our target is three to six degree of mechanical valgus, and there should be ten degree of uh, femorotibial angle. That is long axis of femur and long axis of tibia. The angle between these two is. 10 degree. So this is anatomical valgus and MPTA is here 99 degree. So after surgery, this is the preoperative clinical picture. And on second post of day, we allow patient to bear weight, uh, partial weight bearing like this. And uh, they can go for the toilet purpose and they become mobile on the next day. So this is the advantage of uh, uh, that they are mobilized quickly uh, after surgery. So, uh, so now if patients are young and have normal BMI or uh, not more BMI, then we do both the, uh, uh, on both sides, we do high tibial osteotomy and a single stage. Here is a 49 year old female with pain in her both knees since, since long and uh, then scanogram was taken and it was it was planned to do uh, bilateral high tibial osteotomy in a single stage. And here uh, after surgery, the weight bearing exists very well past near the Fujisawa point. This is a clinical picture and this is the lateral view. And uh, we allow her to walk on the fourth post-operative. This is the fourth post-operative day. This is, uh, she was encouraged to walk, but not much. That is very restricted uh, walking on the fourth post-operative day, even after doing bilateral high tibial osteotomy in a single stage. So, but we don't do after age of 55 years, and also we don't do it with a high BMI, even with a younger patient, even in young patients. Then we advise them to do one after the one uh, and second after six months. So this is uh, the clinical final picture, pre-operative and post-operative of the bilateral high tibial osteotomy. So uh, there are limitations uh, of uh, open wedge, not only open wedge, but uh, even supratuberosity closed wedge. Uh, virus more than 12 degree may not be possible probably by coventry osteotomy. Flexor deformity more than 10 degree probably becomes difficult with a supratuberosity or open wedge and valgus uh, lateral compartment osteoarthritis uh, with lateral uh, valgus knee probably uh, open wedge lateral open wedge has not been described and here we can see that uh, varus more than here 12 degree but here on one side it is 26 degree and on another side it is 18 degree this is the clinical picture of this before surgery and we, after hto we can see here that is very well corrected and in post-operative x-ray also we can appreciate that the correction has been achieved at, as we desired and after surgery we can see that how she was walking before surgery and after bilateral high tibial osteotomy the gait has been improved and she can walk very comfortably. So here flexion deformity more than 10 degree here we can see that about 20 to 20 degree, more than 20 degree of flexion deformity that flexion deformity has been corrected very well and varus also has been corrected very well. And this is the uh, 
pre-operative pre and post-operative uh, clinic x-ray picture here we can see that weight bearing axis is very well corrected the accent deformity was corrected by alteration of posterior tibial slope so uh, slope was reversed and in that uh, way uh, we have corrected ffd by removing uh, the base anterior more base and posterior less base and in that way we have corrected the flexion deformity and how she was walking how she was walking before surgery and after surgery of bilateral on both sides we can see that now she is walking comfortably so this is how the advantage of uh, uh, doing high tibial ost uh, osteotomy at little lower level at the level of tib uh, tibial tuberosity we can correct flexion deformity also we can correct more varus also and we can do even uh, medial close wedge in lateral compartment arthritis here is a lateral compartment arthritis we can see valgus knee here after surgery the limb has been straightened patient can uh, do per vajrasan can even do padmasan and can squat also and this was a clear x-ray picture before this is lateral compartment arthritis weight bearing axis has been corrected to the center of the knee joint and he was doing able to full function another thing is internal tibial torsion is also possible to correct uh, uh, during close wedge high tibial osteotomy, we can always rotate the distal fragment to bring the patella in center and yeah, internal tibial torsion in a normal torsion. Here we, we can see that there is a TBI is inter, internal tibial torsion, patella is like this. After surgery, we can see that patella is and uh, this limb uh, is uh, the rotation internal tibial torsion was corrected. So, so this is this is uh, the dynamic varus we can see that while she was bearing weight the varus was increasing so uh, if we look the x-ray then on weight bearing x-ray was like this there was a lot of opening on the lateral joint space and if we take a non-weight bearing x-ray then it was like this so we always calculate a non-weight bearing x-ray and after surgery it was corrected very nicely near the Fujisawa point and uh, uh, that was a after six months, this was weight bearing x ray. Now, this opening was not after this correction. And if we see after surgery that uh, this uh, dynamic virus has been corrected, now post operatively we can see that there is no uh, opening of lateral joint space. So, uh, if we do proper high tibial osteotomy, even virus more than 15 degree and dynamic virus all raise then can be corrected. Here we can see that there is a lateral thrust on the left side. We can see tibia, uh, proximal tibia migrates laterally on weight bearing. This is a lateral tibial thrust on weight bearing. On left side, we can appreciate that. And if we examine her clinically, there was a, if we examine her clinically, uh, there was a uh, laxity of lateral collateral ligament not only laxity of lateral collateral ligament, medial collateral ligament was good. And this is the how, and then there was a laxity of anterior cruciate ligament also. See, there is a there was a laxity of anterior cruciate ligament also. So there was two ligament laxity that leads to lateral tibial thrust. And after surgery, we can see that lateral tibial thrust has been gone after correction of varus. And in this particular case, Varus was also corrected and posterior tibial slope was also corrected. If we see the post-operative x-ray, pre-operative and post-operative x-ray is like this. And uh, after doing bo both, she can able to sit cross leg. So here, this posterior tibial slope was also corrected. Not only varus was corrected. Here, there was too much of posterior tibial slope. It was bring to the normal. So uh, it's not out of complication. So the uh, complication is always there uh, not always but there is also a uh, few complications which we can face in this is the excessive valgus what i have faced in my practice and this is the non-union uh, thanks for your kind attention thank you sir mm -hmm.